Hello, 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 and welcome back to Alice Talks Football, and welcome back to a live Manchester United show. We've got so much to deep dive and get in. To in today's show, Fabrizio Romano dropped a massive update on Tenag transfers in and off his plans, which has has had a bit of a negative reaction. Had a couple of people a little bit concerned. Personally, I'm not concerned or worried about. There was obviously the rumours of Tenag and Rashford having a fallout, and it was all Twitter rumours of people with no credibility making stuff up. And Romano's again confirmed there's no issues going on between Tenag and Rashford. And then we've had a few other stories drop about Evan Ferguson potential transfer plans. One that I am worried about is midfield. Apparently, it's not a priority now. That is a bit of concern. But yeah, there's a lot of news coming in, particularly on Tenog's future. There's been a lot deserving in Argosman. Potter rumours and we're going to talk about that to begin with because I want to get that out of the way because I feel like a lot of live streams were just talking about one article saying 10 hours staying the other article saying 10 hours going so it does get a bit boring but it has caused a little a few fans to be a bit worried so I thought I would get into this um I hope the quality of the stream is okay we've had a few connection issues so if there's any problems let me know and I'll, I'll see what I can do I know the thumbnail has been coming out blurry as well but big up to everybody in the chat how are you feeling today after the 2-2 draw for the go live as well we can talk a little bit about the draw it won't be super long live stream because i've got to get back but how are you feeling about the draw i just think we've taken four points off liverpool in their title charge we probably didn't really deserve a point although i think in the second half we brought a fight and maybe in the second half we were all right um so i'm glad we got the point um it's annoying to bottle the three points but i'll take the point considering it wasn't our best performance as well I don't understand how midfield may not be priority. We could lose three or four midfielders. Exactly. For me, midfield should be priority. And we're going to get into that in a second. But let's talk about this story. And this has come from Romano. For Richard Romano went on the United Stand today. And here's a summary of some of the main points he made. He said, what I'm hearing is the same. Ineos want to give um, time to every Tenag. He said, Ineos are keeping all their options open and having positive discussions with Tenag. Ineos aren't speaking to any manager at this stage. And while Ineos wants to see how the last two months of the season go, and it's all, and it's but it's also about results, we can't be 100% sure Eric Ten Hag staying past the end of the season. So Romano is very honest. He doesn't say for certain if Ten Hag staying or going, but what Romano is saying is very similar to what Whitwell's saying and very similar to what Ornstein's saying. And they're probably the three most credible people in the Manchester United space. Right now, Ineos are not talking to any managers and haven't made any action to approach any managers and they're planning for next season with Ten Hag as if he's staying. He said no decision's been 100% made and Ineos could change their mind. But right now, at this moment in time, from what he knows, he'd assume that Ineos are planning for next season with Ten Hag. But as Whitwell said, as Ornstein said, Ineos aren't fully convinced by Ten Hag. Things could change. But as of now, they're planning for next season with Ten Hag, which makes, to be honest, sense. And I know a lot of people are sort of upset about this, saying, oh, with Ineos keep with Ten Hag, they're not serious. They're not serious. I've seen this outrage online. And it's like, well, to be honest, yes, I am Ten Hag in and I want Ten Hag to be given time because I don't think bringing in a new manager changes a lot when the squad and the recruitment is probably a bigger issue to address than the manager because we don't have the physical technical flooring in the players to play a certain way. I would understand if Ineos sat Ten Hag despite being Ten Hag in because you look at the performance, you look at the structure, you look at the way we are set up. It is really, really poor. It is really, really bad. As someone that wants Ten Hag to stay and succeed and be given time, if Ineos do decide to sack him, I could see reasons why. If Ineos decide to keep Tanakh, I can see reasons why. I think whatever Ineos decide to do, I think there's reasons for it either way. And you've got to be understanding of that, even if it's what you wouldn't do. Ineos are looking at this with a long term as a long term project, what they want in the long term, and if Tanakh can achieve that. And I see a lot of people saying, oh, Ineos aren't serious if they keep Tanakh. Well, Surely, if Ineos keep Ten Hag, it's because they know there's bigger problems than the manager, which is what we've been saying for years, probably because they know the squad and recruitment's a bigger thing. And even if Ineos keep Ten Hag, that doesn't necessarily mean he'll be the long-term manager. I saw a lot of people upset saying Ineos are on fraud watch because they're, 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 they're keeping Ten Hag. I saw reactions like this, and I think, obviously, I'm Ten, ten Hag out. Sorry, Ten Hag in. Ten Hag in. So, obviously, I don't agree with the Ten Hag out as saying Ineos are on fraud watch for keeping Ten Hag. I think that's a bit of a silly assumption. But I also think that Ineos might keep Ten Hag with the plan to get rid of him in December if it doesn't work. You've got to remember, Ten Hag is going from manager to almost head coach and he's relinquishing a lot of control. And Ineos is said to take hands of the recruitment and buy players to play a certain way and wants Ten Hag to play that certain way. Now, that puts Ineos in an easier position if they sat Ten Hag to bring in another head coach because Ineos will sign players to play this brand of football, hope Ten Hag can do that. If he can't do that, they can get rid of him. They can bring someone in at Christmas time that can do that to play that football. Similar to Brighton, Potter played good football. He left, and Zerbi was able to pick up because they didn't buy players for Graham Potter. They played players that could play a certain way and ask Graham Potter to coach that. 
then that's what Deserby does. That's what Ineos wants to implement. So Ineos sort of have this plan of, you know, we want to play this way and we're going to recruit players to play this way. And it might not necessarily be about Ten Hag and Ten Hag's ball. And then Ten Hag's just going to be the coach and do that. And if you can't implement that, they might sack him in December and bring in someone else. I think Ineos look at it and think, well, it's going to cost money to sack Ten Hag and bring someone else in. Barca, Bayern, Liverpool, all looking at managers. Amarin, Nagelsmann, Deserbi could all be eaten up. Is Graham Potter necessarily improvement on Ten Hag? Is Southgate an improvement on Ten Hag? No. So why are we going to spend money to sack Ten Hag and replace him with a manager that might be worse? And then we go two years back in the project when at least Ten Hag's have two years with these players. And I think 90% of the squad like Ten Hag or want Ten Hag to say. Ineos might say, you know what, let's sort, sort out recruitment. Let's focus on recruitment. Let's play five players to play this way and this way we want to play. And if Ten Hag isn't capable of coaching that, we'll sack him at Christmas time. But let's focus on the chance to win it. Let's not change too much at once. I think Ineos, unless things get really bad between now and the end of the season, will probably keep Ten Hag. Maybe, maybe, maybe not with the plan of keeping him long, long, long term, but they might keep Ten Hag because it might just be the easier and the better financially, better financial decision at the time. That's what I think. And that's what I wouldn't be completely surprised by. And you've got to also remember, you know, there's a lot of teams looking for managers. Ten Hag has his uh, flaws, but this squad is poorly ins assembled and theory squad. Exactly. Ten Hag's, you know, Ten Hag's got a lot wrong and there's, there's a lot of things Ten Hag can improve on. There's a lot of things I'll be critical with Ten Hag about and, you know, the amount of shots we're conceding, the way we're playing, we're playing some of the worst football in Europe. I know that I'm not naive to that and I understand why people are Ten Hag out and I'd understand if Ineos wanted to sack Ten Hag off the back of that because it could be better. But I just think we've had so many years of sacking managers over and over again, sacking manager, sacking manager, sacking manager, that I would just like to see changes to the squad happen first. I wanted Ten Hag to come in because of the brilliant football he played at Ajax. He comes to United, he tries to play brilliant football, we lose, we go to bad football. Ragnit played good football, goes to bad football. I think Nogs been an hour and played great football, but I don't know if they can come to United and play great football until we address the squad. Ten Hag might not be the guy in, in three years' time, but he might be the guy that we just keep for another year until we get the players for the next manager to take over as well. To be honest, Ineos don't have the money, even using PR to build their reputation about the takeover looks nice and how would 200 million just gone already for the credit facility. I don't think Ineos want to spend money on sacking the manager because they've got to pay gardening leaves. There's got a lot to do in the chance of the window. I don't think Ineos are really interested in even paying the money to sack Ten Hag or to get another manager. And I think uh, financially, I think one of the reasons Ten Hag could stay and one of the reasons a lot of the credible sources are suggesting that Ten Hag could stay it might generally be for financial reasons. Guys, please do that like button and, of course, subscribe down below if you're new and share the video. I want to get into the next stories. We've got look When I say we've got a lot to get through, I mean, we've got a lot to get through. And I want to try and sum this up in the next half an hour for you guys. But it was said on Nagelsmann that if Manchester United want to bring Julian Nagelsmann as their next as their new, as their next manager, they would have to, have to act fast as he could sign a new deal with the German national team or return to Bayern. There's going to be a lot of competition with Bayern, Barcelona and Liverpool looking for managers. If we want Nagelsmann, we'd have to act fast. And considering that, you know, as far as we're aware, haven't made any actions to approach any managers, I have a feeling they're not particularly interested in, in, in maybe going for Nagelsmann unless things go really wrong. Tactically, though, only alternative is to part the bus. The squad isn't capable of anything else, which is the worrying truth as well. We don't have a style. I think the biggest, my biggest criticism of Ten Hag is his stubbornness. My biggest criticism of Ten Hag is it's more the fact that we'll be playing awful football like awful football and there's no style as you said and then Ten Hag will come out and, and, and a post-match interview and say we played well and you can see our style and, and and he's not concerned with conceding a lot of shots that's my biggest problem with Ten Hag is what he says post-match interview almost makes me feel like does he not realise that we've conceded the most shots in 2024 does he not realise that our style of football is awful we don't really have a plan and we don't really have a style of football because the way Ten Hag acts in press conferences and stuff he looks almost oblivious to the fact that we are playing bad football and conceding shots. He must act like that's not a problem. That would be my biggest criticism of him. Um, there was a lot of rumours about Rashford and, and Ten Hag. The Twitter rumours having a fallout and that's why Rashford was benched versus Chelsea and he's been naughty again. And I think it's more, we're not having a good season. Lots of people don't like Ten Hag. Lots of people don't like Rashford in the fan base. These kind of stories get clicks because it's going to wind people up. I think people just speculate because of Belfast, because Rashford's bench, there's been a fallout between him and Ten Hag. But Romano said nothing's happened. There's no issues between Romano and Ten Hag. Maybe, you know, they've not been on best terms this season because of Belfast, for sure. But as far as we're aware, nothing's really happening. Maybe the media's just looking at that as a story that's going to get people riled up, putting out reports about sort of Rashford, Ten Hag fallout as well. 
New gaffer likely out of uh, a lot of second and third chances. Eric Tenog should stay and get the clear out. Yeah. I think with the amount of clubs looking for managers, getting a new manager in will be quite difficult for United as well. Um, Man United make it uh, hell Trafford for Liverpool. You stop them from winning quadruple and, and could stop them from winning treble, a league title by a point. Yeah. I mean, we've done our bit to stop Liverpool in the FA Cup. and We've took four points off Liverpool. We've done our bit to stop them in the league. I mean, I don't want Arsenal to win. I don't want City to win, but we need them to do their thing because I definitely don't want Liverpool to win. Someone said sell Rashford and get Nico Williams and Cubo. Cubo, I don't know if he'd suit our style of play. Uh, Nico Williams I do really like, but I'd rather sell Sancho and get Nico Williams than sell Rashford and get Nico Williams because I think Rashford will have more use next season than Sancho because at least he wants to play. Um, yeah. Um, a concern for me is his signings, choosing players he didn't sign over his own. If he doesn't, if he does this next season, we could be down for Do you know what? My big, another big criticism of Tenog is the lack of use of Amrabat. I like Casemiro, but he's been atrocious. Um, you know, Mount and Amrabat, you signed. Mount, obviously, the injuries and stuff, I get why he's not starting Moldem in. I'd like to see Mount and Amrabat go in that midfield with Cobby and Bruno. I, that, for me, that's what I'd like to see. There is no better football with this squad. Overhaul is required, Eric Tenog. I agree. I don't think that much. I think maybe we'd be structurally a little bit better with a different manager, for sure, because uh, structurally it's bad. But I don't think overall we'd be much better with a new manager right now with the current players that we've got. We're physically and technically not to the level. And it's a shame. It's a shame because we're Manchester United. We should physically and technically be to that level. But physically and technically, Manchester United are not at the level needed. Uh, there are reports of Rashford being injured, and we will dive into the injury news, but nothing has been confirmed. But yeah, I, I, I would have liked to see Amrabat have more minutes this season. I think while Amrabat hasn't been good, he came injured. He's never really been given a run of games to warm up and he's mostly been put at left back, which isn't his position. We're like, we signed Amrabat because he's secure in possession, but then we've not used Amrabat in his best role or given him a run of games to warm up post-injury when Casemiro's not been good, Tomine's not been good, Ericsson's not been good. It's not like we've been winning every game and Amrabat can't get in the team. You know, Carlton Phillips couldn't get in the Man City side because they were just winning every game and they were so good. And he, he said, like, we could use Amrabat and we're not as well. In terms of the injury latest, we've got some updates and news coming in on Scott McTominay. He was not used against Liverpool because he felt some discomfort in his knee after suffering a hypertension against Chelsea. A report suggests it's not serious, but he could be out for two to three weeks, depending on rehab. So he's going to miss a couple of weeks, but he won't be out too much. I think as a super sub, McTominay is what you like. Um, not as a starter, as a super sub, I like McTominay. Not good enough to start. I do think that Rashford put in some good crosses and had McTominay been about, I think he gets his head on the end of those crosses and maybe 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 we've been the game. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Amrabat's best role was on the bench. I mean, look, he's not been great this season, I know, but I would just like, I just think he could be given more money. Casemiro, I generally think his head is in Saudi, heart doesn't look anymore. I agree. I like Casemiro. He was brilliant for us last season. Yes, the tactical changes that Tenog's made this season. And, ooh, ooh, well, nicked a button by the state by mistake there. Yes, the tactical changes in the way that we play this season makes Casemiro's job 10 times harder for him. Um, and it's not totally his fault with his drop-off because the work we're asking him to do is impossible, particularly if you know the type of player Casemiro is. And maybe you can say, look, that is on Ten Hag. But ultimately, Casemiro is, is, is not been good. He's been a shadow of his former self. And I think we need to cash in from Saudi. Saudi are interested in him. There's no bids. But I don't think Casemiro's head's there anymore, as Alex said. And I think when the Saudi offer comes in, you might say, do you know what? There could be an opportunity to cash in on Casemiro here. But the thing is, Ericsson's probably done. Casemiro probably needs to be cashed in on a go to Saudi. Um, McTominay's not good enough to start. You look at sort of the situation with our midfield um, and, you, you know, Donny's going to go, Amrabat's going to go. You think, well, we, how is midfield not a priority when we need at least two midfielders and one of them's got to be a number six? We need, a, we need to do what Liverpool did. Liverpool got rid of four or five midfielders and brought four in. Liverpool got rid of Cater, Milner, Fabinho, Henderson and Oxlade, Chamberlain, five midfielders and brought in Gavin Birch, Endo, McAllister and Soberslai. And Liverpool finished fifth last season. They're now in a title race. Do you know what I mean? Like the difference that made rebuilding the midfield. I think midfield is an area that we've neglected so many transfer windows. I think there's been five or six transfer windows that I can think of in the last 10 years since Sir Alex Ferguson's left, where I felt that we haven't got the midfielder we needed and I felt that we've needed a midfielder and then we've prioritised other issues. I think there's been five transfer windows that we've gone into where I felt DM is priority and United haven't and we haven't gone out and signed that DM five of the last 10 transfer windows. So if Man United have another window where they don't go out for a DM or they don't prioritise for, 
prioritize a DM signing, that is going to worry me because I think that DM, in my opinion, should be one of, if not Manchester United's sort of priority signing as well. Casemiro is playing with an injury. It's clear not his fault. He's not a runner. It's different to some other players. Like, I agree most like to cash in. It does look like Casemiro is injured because he's lost that sort of pace and he doesn't like to run too hard and the way players get past him as well. Seven points lost in a week. Um, imagine what we, we could be close to Villa. That's the thing. The most annoying thing about this week is although the performances haven't warranted necessarily wins, we've been winning positions in our last three games and we've bottled five points within the last minute of a game versus Brentford, the last minute of the game versus Chelsea. And we couldn't hold on to our lead versus Liverpool because we'd given away a silly penalty. For me, we've dropped seven points. Had we had those seven points, we'd be, what, three points behind Villa with a game in hand, obviously a better goal difference. We'd be closing in on that fifth place. And that fifth place spot up gets Manchester United in the Champions League. So I think us dropping points has been really, really frustrating. I completely agree with you as well. Um, Casemiro only turned into a one-year fix. We need numbers in midfield. We need a long-term. We need a long-term plan. Liverpool brought in McAllister, Sobersly, Endo when they got rid of Fabinho and, and and Henderson. They got rid of the older players. They brought a new fresher leg. McTominay, this is the last chance to cash in on him. He's got to go. Eriksson's got to go. Amrabat will go. Casemiro will go. I want to see us get a top, top number six, maybe an Amadou Inanna, some fresh legs, maybe a Matt Sweefer, maybe a Hulman. Maybe we go for Fafana, he's 25 million. I want to sign someone that can play as a six, that can play as an eight that's physical. And then I also want to get a player that's technically good and can retain the ball. I, I, if I was Man United, I'd try to get someone like Curtis Jones, which is people will laugh at me for saying that. I think Curtis Jones would be a very good signing for Manchester United. He plays for Liverpool, so it won't happen. But I think he could offer a lot for United. I think Max and Kakare could be a good one. Um, I think potent there's potential for players like that. The uh, player AC Milan, Benica, could be a good one. There there's some good options out there, but I think I think Benson Kerr of, of, of Tottenham would be a good one, but that's not going to happen, is it? I think we need someone that's physical, can play as a six, can play as an eight, can do the work off the ball, so Kobe Mayno can excel on the ball, because we know Kobe's quality is on the ball. We need someone to unlock that. And I think we need at least two midfielders. I think we need two midfielders. I think we need two centre-backs. I think we need two midfielders. I think we need a winger. I think we need another striker. And I think we need a full-back for depth. That, that's seven signings. I don't think we're going to do that unless we sell incredibly well. Sell Sancho, sell Greenwood, sell McTominay, sell Eriksson, sell Amrabat, what Amrabat leaves anyway. Sell Casemiro, Saudi give us good money. Uh, sell McTominay, sell Lindelof, sell, sell Maguire, keep Varane, don't let Varane go on a free. Maybe the funds there are raised for United to do the business that they need to do because there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of business that we need to do this summer and I don't have the confidence that we'll do it. Um, in terms of summer business as well, we had a little bit of an update saying that Donny's probably going to come back because Frankfurt don't want him. Um, Romano says he doesn't think Juventus will go for Greenwood despite rumours. I think a lot of the Greenwood rumours is Greenwood's sort of agent putting out stuff to the sun to try and create interest. Um, I think John Mertz is working really hard to try and sell Greenwood and get some offers for Greenwood going around Spain. I think Greenwood will go. I don't think we're bringing back and we know that Saudi clubs are generally offered in Cas interest in Casemiro no offer's been made but I think Casemiro's head now is probably in Saudi Arabia for sure um, Villa have to play Arsenal Chelsea Brighton and Liverpool too Villa and Villa and Tottenham will have to play the teams in the title race and they can have a big say they can have a big say in the title race as well um, seven points dropped is absolutely mad as well uh, even Garner, the energy and tenacity, you could have used him. That's the math thing. You look at some of the players, you look at James Garner right now, we, we could really use him. We, we could have really, really used him. Um, someone said Kakare's chest, Coach Jones's average would be expensive. We need to we need to be smart. We need to be smart with our midfield. We need to find some gems in midfield that are sort of 25, 30 million. We need to be smart. Like, you know how Liverpool found Endo? I know he's, a, he's not a long-term signing because he's 30. But we need to be smart. We need to look at the Bundesliga. We need to look at the league. We need to look at league on. We need to find some smart kind of signing. I think Kakare is a good player, but he's had a bit of a poor season. But I was just sort of naming players off the top of my head. Um, I'd like to see um, Matt Sweefer. I'd like to see Amadou Anana, Percy and myself. But United have got to be smart this summer as well. It go, no debate if we lose to Coventry 10 August down. I tell you what, for me, the season's over, but it's not over because we've got the FA Cup. I and mean, for me, we've got to win the FA Cup if we want to save the season. If we get to the final and you lose to Man City and you put in a good performance, sometimes you have to just be like, it's not what I want to see, but it's football. If we lose to Coventry, that is, for me, unforgivable. Um, Coventry's going to give everything as well. Um, 
We need two DMs. We're so poor on defence. We definitely need proper DMs out there. I think I'm surprised we haven't been linked more to the likes of Subamende, if I'm going to be honest with you as well. We need some more height and, height and leg next to Kobe, which is why I think Amadou Anana could be a really good profile. Because although I have worries about him on the ball, we know how good Kobe is on the ball. Uh, someone said Andrich from Leverkusen. We have been linked to Palacios of Leverkusen as well. Could be a good option there, again, with his technical ability. But again, he's had injury problems and stuff. Now, Fabrizio Romano does give us a update on transfers and stuff as well. Um, in regards to strikers, he said that there's some names that Manchester United are following, but they haven't decided on who or what profile of striker is their top target. He said lots of people at Man United are fans of Evan Ferguson, but at the moment, Brighton aren't putting a price tag on him. When Ineos took over, a lot of figures believe uh, Evan Ferguson would be the perfect player for the future. Evan Ferguson's a very good player, but I'm, 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 I'm going to be honest with you, he's been crap the second half of the season. He can't get in the bright side of a Danny Welbeck. Hoyland's very raw, Everson, Evan Ferguson's very raw. Um, while Sesco is very raw as well, at least he's in good form, Cirque, he's less raw at 22. Again, he's only a little bit older than Hoyland. For me, Brighton are going to ask a fortune for Evan Ferguson. I think he's a great player, but he's not been great this season. Brighton are going to ask for 60, 70 million. I will go and spend 35 million on Cirque. Cirque, according to Florian Plettyberg, will be available for 35 million pounds this summer. He's ready now. He potentially puts Hoyland on the bench. He would have been really suited to that Liverpool game because he could have facilitated the wingers. He would have been really suited. I think he can play with Hoyland as well as play and put Hoyland on the bench or as well as be back up for Hoyland. And he's 35 million. I like Evan Ferguson, but if I'm getting a striker right now, it is Cirque. It is Cirque. Um, Evan Ferguson and Sesco, I'm big fans of them for the right price. I'm happy with it. I think they've got bang in the potential. But if I'm getting a striker right now, I'm going for Cirque. People say Giracy 28. Uh, for the price could be a good option. It could be, but I think the fear with Giresi is, you know, he's having one good season and the other seasons he's he's overperforming this season. Would he come to United and actually, because we don't create any service and any chances, not really do anything, is he overperforming this season or is he just generally become good? Uh, Romano seems to think Cirque he's staying in Serie A. There's a lot of rumours and suggestions he's probably going to go to Juventus, which is a little bit annoying. Evan Ferguson will lose whatever potential he has if he plays at United. I mean, look at Hoyland. I mean, Hoyland's been really good. Hoyland wasn't great versus Liverpool, but I think Hoyland had a really good spell where we can see the quality Hoyland has, but he's completely starved of service. You've got to feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for any striker we sign because we know they're going to be starved of service, which for me is why it's so important we get a striker like Cirque that can create his own service. Same with Hoyland as well. Uh, Romano did say Cirque could be more expensive. Yeah, I mean, Petty Berg and a couple of sources said he's 35 million with confidence, but I don't think anyone really, really knows about it. Might be a one season wonder as well. I think it's a one season wonder as well. What about the athletic new article about Qatar suing United for defamatory case? Um, there's, again, we'll wait for developments on that Qatar as well. Sorry, Alice, we need three centre halves, probably three midfielders, a striker, and other positions. We have no chance. We've got so much to do, which is why I don't think we'll get the likes of Jao Neves um, as good as he is because of the price. I don't think we could afford to spend over 60 million on one position, really, because of the amount of positions we need to address. In other news, it's also come out and said that John Claire Todibo would cost 40 million. I think because of United's relationship with Nice, we could almost get it in instalments and potentially 35 million and loan the man Salimo. It's also said that Todibo is expected to leave Nice this summer. We know that Todibo almost left Nice for Tottenham, but Nice pulled the plug on that. Could that be Ratcliffe pulling the strings behind the scenes because he wants to get Todibo at United? Physically, athletically, and technically, Manchester United lack, and you've got that in Todibo. I think a defence of Varane, Ramfway, Todibo. Um, in uh, Cambuala, Martinez does fill me with a lot more confidence than our current defence. It's also talked about Bremer, 60 million release clause active in 2025. I don't think United will go for Bremer unless he's going to be in the 40 million range. I think United want Tolibo because he's probably easy to do with the relationship with Nice once the movie looked at him last season. Um, and then I think United would probably go for Bramfway if Bremer's only going to be 5 million cheaper. I think if Bramfway is under is 60 million, if we can get Bramfway for 60 million, which I don't know if we will be able to because of English tax, I think United could go for Bramfway. We could also go for Tossin of Fulham as well as centre back. 71 likes away from three from 100 likes, guys. So please do hit that like button if you haven't already. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Do you wonder if we sign, let's say, Elise Todd and Sesco will dramatically improve us? Um, I do think they're good signings, but I do think ultimately, unless we sort out the midfield, we're not going to get too much better. I think Elise Todd and I think Elise and Todd can improve us. Sesco gives us better depth. I think it's we need to sort out that midfield if we want to improve because what we don't have is controller games, and that ultimately, in my opinion, comes from the midfield as well. Um, 
if United get Southgate, we'll be buying Aston Villa players. Well, we won't be getting Southgate. I, I think the Southgate is all just sort of rumours. I, I don't think we'll get Southgate, to be honest with you guys. I'm not worried about any of going Southgate. I think they would stick with Ten Hag over Southgate as well. Southgate be out in six months. Uh, fans will have him. I don't, I don't think, I think United fans, I don't think there's any real United fans that want Southgate over Ten Hag. I don't know any any United fan that I've seen that wants Southgate under Ten Hag. I know people that are Ten Hag out, but they say they'll be Ten Hag in rather than bring Southgate in because what Ten Hag's done at Ajax, he's believed to be a better manager than Southgate. I think Southgate could be a good Premier League manager for a mid-table club, but not a club that has ambition because I think he can do well with average players when he can't get the best out of good players, if you know what I'm saying. I don't think Southgate's as bad as manager as being made out. He's had success with England for a reason, but I think he's a B-tech Oli. Continuing on. What other news has come out? What other news has been said? So it said signing a player like Jao Neves as a midfielder is very unlikely due to the price tag says for Ritsu Romano. We spoke about this earlier. I like Jao Neves, massive fan of him. But again, Jao Neves may know Bruno midfield lacks the out of position awareness, physical flooring. Uh, Jao Neves would be brilliant. Maybe if he stays at Benfica one more year, we go for him next season. But we need to get that number six. We need to get about seven positions addressed. So I don't think we're in a position when we can spay, spend over 80 million on one player. They said that United will go for left back, but the budget isn't decided. Although there was a report yesterday saying that we'd spend max 15 million on a left back. But United are going to sign on regardless of Sean Molassi's situation due to their injury issues. And Romano again also confirmed that Elise is really appreciated by Man United, even before Ineos' arrival, and he'll be a candidate for sure. I think if I had to put money on a transfer happening this summer, Elise would be the first one I put money on, and Tolibo would be the second one I put money on. We know that Man United like Elise. We know Elise is a massive Man United fan, and we know that Crystal Palace are open to selling him, so that's three ticks. We know he's available at £50 million, which is a decent price, which is a fourth tick. You know, there's a lot of sort of positives around Elise and around Manchester United that I feel there's a big, strong possibility that Elise does come to Manchester United this summer. He's come back from injury. If he can stay fit between now and the end of the season, go on a decent run. I think he, he would choose to go to United over other clubs reportedly. We've had contact with him reportedly. He's an Ineos target. Brailsford rates him. You know, we're rumoured to bring in Doogie Friedman, obviously scouted him for... Um, multiple years at Crystal Palace. Um, I think Elise's one, but if Palace are open to selling him, which is reported, United won him and he's a United fan. And as Roman has spoken about, I think if it do happens, Elise's one to put my money on. I think Tolibo is another one that I watch as well. Uh, continuing on as well, Bramford could be another option, but we've bought them out for a long time. I wouldn't be surprised if Newcastle went all out to lure Bramford in. Uh, Real Madrid are also interested in him. I think all the top clubs are going to be interested in Bramford, particularly the Premier League clubs because he's English, and that means that's a homegrown player as well, which you need for rules. Yeah, whoever scouted Cambola needs to go out there and bring us some talent. We'll talk about that in a second, but have done a really good job there as well. Um, and then in terms of this, and this for me was a little bit worrying, was um, Romano saying this, the priority positions at the moment seem to be centre-back, left-back and striker. The midfield will depend on the budget and sales. For me, I think DM is probably the most important position. And then I think we sell the midfielders and then we get a second midfielder in. I, I, I don't understand how midfield isn't a priority. I guess, you know, if we can't sell any of our midfielders, then I understand United might, want to, might not want to buy any. But surely midfield has got to be a priority position this summer. When you look at how we're getting run through, you look at the amount of shots we're conceding, there's no way United aren't looking at things and thinking, yeah, nah, we ain't going to make me feel the priority as well. Ahmed deserves a chance. I understand why Ahmed wasn't brought on in the end yesterday, but yeah, he definitely deserves a chance. He scored a goal and he's not been seen since. And I think he's a very, very good player. I'd like to see Ahmed given an opportunity and, and a lot more of a chance. Completely, completely agree with you there. I think Ahmed, Kambuala, Maynou, gone after the positives this season, the youth. Let's hope Kambuala was a long overdue centre-back from the academy, been ages for us. Yeah. Um, I think as well with Kambwala, he, when he signed for United, he was so highly rated. Kambwala is one of the highest rated young centre-backs out there. He captained France. People forget this, but Kambwala captained France at all the sort of academy and under, under, underage levels. And when Kambwala was 14, he played for France's under-16s and captains them. He was seen as the best young centre-back talent to come out of France, Willie Kambwala was. And John Murta went on the spree where Man United brought the best academy talents around the world in 2020. They brought Conacho, Hansen Aaron, Alvaro Fernandez, Kambwala. And Kambwala was seen as the best of them. And he was great when he first got to United. Then he got injured and he's practically spent 
two years on the sideline. But when we brought Kambuala, he was basically the best centre back in his age range, the best centre back in his age group because of how good he was physically, how fast he is, and how technical he was. And we saw that versus Liverpool. He was physically good. He dealt with Nunes very well, pushing off the ball. He was fast. He lost out on the ball when he caught Diaz, who's rapid, and then he was making some good passes. There's a really, really good player in Willy Kambuala. And I'm really glad that he's back and he's managed to stay fit. This is his longest period of sustained fitness because he practically had three years out injured and Man United have played three million euros for him which is a lot of money for such a young kid but Willy Kambuala in terms of his potential when we signed him was sent to be you know the next big centre back thing and definitely someone you know actually invest their energy and I think there's a good player in there and I think he's someone to build around obviously there'll be consistencies there'll be issues with Willy Kambuala but in my opinion he's definitely someone you actually build around I think while United's a big mess and while there's a lot to do you do look at the core of the squad and you say you know what he also got Mano, Kambuala, Garnacho, even players like Delo and Martinez can be a bit of use in Hoyland there is players to build around and build a long-term project around and Kabbala and Tordobo would be an interesting duo move Martinez DM I think Martinez is a centre-back for me but there's always the opportunity there why buy a left-back we have Harry Amas Harry Amas is brilliant and he could be that next left-back but I don't know if Tenog wants to take that risk if you want someone more experienced Axel was near certain he was going to make it for us his pace and natural sense of instincts were unreal I think if he didn't get injured Axel to and Zavi there was a chance he could have made it for us and um, he's doing really well at Ipswich since coming in as well and I think Axel to and Zavi will become a regular Premier League player in the next few seasons, although he's playing at the Championship. I think injuries set him back. But I think Kambuala is probably, you know, Mengi's now a regular in the in the Premier League. I think uh, Axel will soon be a regular in the Premier League. We've had some really good centre-backs come through that become Premier League players, but not regulars for United. Could Kambuala be that guy that's a regular for United as well? Oh, crap. What's that? It's my alarm going off, which means I've got to wrap up the live stream. But we got everybody tuning into today's live show. Please do hit the like button on the way out. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new. I might have a bonus video coming out tonight. I'm working on a video um, that I think is going to be a really good video about Kambuala, about Garnacho, about what we did in 2020 with the Youth Academy. So if you're interested in that, do subscribe. That might come out tonight, if not tomorrow. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.